On the podcast today, we are going to dissect chapter 25 of the Tao Te Ching. And as usual, Guy Young will read Jia Fu Feng and Jane English's translation, and I will read Derek Lin's translation. Something mysteriously formed, born before heaven and earth, in the silence and the void, standing alone and unchanging, ever present and in motion. Perhaps it is the mother of 10,000 things. I do not know its name, call it Tao. For lack of a better word, I call it great. Being great, it flows. It flows far away. Having gone far, it returns. Therefore, thou is great. Heaven is great. Earth is great. The human being is also great. These are the four great powers of the universe, and the human being is one of them. The human being follows the earth. Earth follows heaven. Heaven follows the Tao. Thou follows what is natural. There is something formlessly created, born before heaven and earth, so silent, so ethereal, independent and changeless, circulating and ceaseless. It can be regarded as the mother of the world. I do not know its name. Identifying it, I call it Tao. Forced to describe it, I call it great. Great means passing. Passing means receding. Receding means returning. Therefore the Tao is great, heaven is great, earth is great, the sovereign is also great. There are four greats in the universe, and the sovereign occupies one of them. Humans follow the laws of earth, earth follows the laws of heaven, heaven follows the laws of Tao, Tao follows the laws of nature. As with previous chapters, Lao Tzu is describing the nature of the Tao in a different way this time. And he's really pinpointing it the spontaneity of the Tao, the spontaneous nature of the Tao. There's a term in Chinese called Zitran, Mm. which is we could translate as naturalness, but it's self so of itself or spontaneously of itself. And this is the nature of the cosmic order that we would say call Tao. Yes. Yes, that's why it's it's only mysterious way that we can describe it, right? And yes, the spontaneous of uh, of itself, that which existed before everything, all ten thousand things, and yes, this is the un- undifferentiated, which contains everything at the same time, and again in this chapter. The greatness of Tao that he's talking that Lao Tzu is describing, and that greatness of the Tao also can be the the great chaos which created by the energy of the Tao before everything, before everything was born, right? And that in that chaos everything came, and that chaos, the complete possibility is the, the origin of the world, and that the supreme ultimate within the Tao is that it's actually before yin and yang. Mm. That's, uh, uh, we, in, in Taoism, we also say tai chi. Tai chi is not just an exercise. Mm. <laughs> tai chi, tai means the great, the supreme, the ultimate. Chi means the energy, the prana. So that great energy, the great energy, the movement, movement of the great energy is the chaos that which everything came from. Exactly. Mm. And Zhuangzi talks about this in the Zhuangzi text too, where he, he talks about the becoming of nothingness. Mm. So when we look at Taoist metaphysics, as you said, he mentions Zhuangzi, that there's, there's like this chaos before the birth of the polarities of the world, yin and yang. Yeah. And that is, as you said, Tai Chi, Tao in motion, which originates from the great nothingness, which is Uchi, mm-hmm. which is Tao in stillness. Mm-hmm. Now you can say, you know, what is the origin of the world? Well, in a Taoist sense, it's it's a it's a great nothingness that gives birth to this supreme ultimate energy that is imbued through all of existence. That's the cosmic order mm-hmm. that we have flowing through us right now. Everything else since the Big Bang. Yes. And as you said, it's completely undifferentiated. Mm-hmm. And it's and it's interesting because in the material world, there's differentiation. 
but we all originate from an undifferentiated state. And the role, especially in this chapter, is to somewhat emulate the sages because they've come back into harmony with the Tao. Yes. But they've come back into harmony with an undifferentiated state of consciousness, yes. which is identical with Uchi. So they've gone through a reversal of energy, which actually is still Tai Chi, but it's a reversal of energy back into the, the origin. Yeah, that's so interesting. Again, like you mentioned, that uh, Taoist metaphysics, there is that complete stillness of universe, which they describe it as Uchi. Yep. Complete nothingness, complete stillness. Mm, yes, yeah, almost like a static, static state of uh, uh, energy, I should say. Mm -hmm. The Uchi, and from Uchi, there is a Tai Chi. Mm comes into place tai chi the great energy then from tai chi there is that movement of that energy comes into place and that's where everything comes from polarity of yin and yang and from the yin and yang then everything comes to existence yeah <clears throat> that's why humans are essentially a, a somewhat the tai chi creature yes because we are the manifestation of of yin and yang mm. and if you look at the yin and yang just the symbol of, of itself you, in Chinese, you can call that simply Tai Chi, yeah. that symbol. You don't, you, we wouldn't typically call it the yin and yang symbol. You'd just say Tai Chi. Because in, in, in understanding Tai Chi, you understand the yin and yang theory. Mm. And so we are that Tai Chi creature that is a manifestation of that great energy. But we still have the origin of the source within us. And that's the goal in some sense for a Taoist or even a spiritual seeker mm -hmm. is to come back and to reverse that energy and, yes. and come back into stillness. Yes. And yeah, it's, it's interesting because um, in, in Korean, actually, that yin and yang symbol, we call it taeguk. Taeguk is identical with tai chi, mm -hmm, I think. Mm -hmm. So it is pretty interesting and Bef before we call it mm. um, yin and yang. Yeah. And the takeoff is on the Korean flag. Yes. Right? Yes. So with trigrams as well. Yeah. And uh, actually the flag, the Korean national flag, we call it takeoff ki. Ki yeah. means um, flag. So takeoff mm. ki. Like, yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. Do you think Koreans know much about the philosophy of that? Or? Um, I hope they do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> anyway, mm. so this chapter is about how this law of nature is reflected within all levels of existence, mm. as both translations mention yeah. what is great, right? So mm -hmm. we have this greatness which is reflected in heaven, earth, and Derek says the sovereign, Jaffe Feng, Jane English say the human, Yes. And so it's reflected in all three of those. Uh, and, that's, and that's the Tao. That's the greatness of the Tao. Uh, the, the difference is, as what Derek was saying with the sovereign, it's, it's more so the sage because this is, in some sense, because when we're talking about spon spon spontaneity and we're talking about sp being spontaneously of itself, and it's something that's organically of itself. It's very uh, originally independent. Mm. And it doesn't depend on other things. And so why Derek uses the word sovereign is because a sage in some sense has become sovereign from the world. Right. But the world here being not the world of nature, but the world of socialization. Yes. Of human beings. Yes, yes. So... The sage has overcome the socialization process and are back in alignment with their actual nature. Mm -hmm. And all of our nature uh, origin is the Tao, but if we look at the term Li, organic pattern, we all have a different organic pattern. And Li, uh, we can translate as the markings in jade, the grain of wood, and the fiber of muscle. Chinese always have interesting ways to translate things. And so, to explain things, sorry. And so we have that, we all have, that's why we are all uh, skilled at different things. Mm. And the idea 
in this chapter is that if we can move back as the sage does to lean into their actual nature, their li, then that's actually what will allow you to bring whatever forth you have within you into the world. Plus you'll be shanti, peaceful, and you, know, you, you're, you are not then trying to mold yourself according to whatever the so society, culture, or religions, or whatever new ideology is out there. You're not molding yourself to that because that's an external system created by human beings yes. for human beings. The Tao, as you mentioned, is undifferentiated and is beyond all human conceptions and concepts. And so you ought to come back into that, and that's where you'll understand your nature more. And actually, interestingly, as Mencius points out in, in his text, is that you'll, you'll start to notice that inherently within us, we have compassion, empathy, humility, but it's the society that teaches us to move away from those because we live in a competitive world where we ought to, you know, stand on each other and 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 climb the, the social ladder. Yes. Yeah, I think um, individual sovereignty here is a very powerful word. I think mm -hmm. because that's what we don't see these day and age, right? Because uh, there is no such thing as sovereignty because everyone seems to. Uh, like to ident identify themselves with the, what's trending in um, like contemporary culture, right? Which is completely the opposite from having your own sovereignty, mm. right? Mm. And when it comes to expressing your own li, own pattern, own, let's say, individuality of your own, it can only shine through their sovereignty. Mm. Because socialization is what's blocking you from actualizing your own li. Yeah. So I think there is a very um, powerful phrase there. Yeah, this is in alignment with the Zen phrase, who were you before you were born? Mm. So your original face. And so Zen and Taoism share this same philosophy, Vedanta as well. Because Atman is that face before you were born as well. Yeah. It's that undifferentiated state of consciousness before you were differentiated by the socialization process that we've all endured. All to different degrees. Yes. You know, like in India, they say the ultimate karmic rebirth is to be born into a, a yogic family. Mm. So maybe you had done a lot of uh, work, work in the now. previous life. Mm. Now it's, it's time to shine now. You know, it's time for moksha release enlightenment but most of us aren't born into a yogi <laughs> family so we're born into uh, ordinary families typical societies cultures religions and then we all endure the socialization process unknowingly from birth because even our parents aren't aware that they went through that process mm. and so you're in this whole samsara pattern or cycle yes. that we're caught in and the Taoist sage, the mm. sovereign, mm. is one who has freed themselves from this. The yogi has as well. The, mm. <clears throat> you know, the great sages of India and China and Southeast Asia and, and in these places, the Buddhas, they've freed themselves from this socialization process. And that's why in the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu puts a big emphasis on not doing what society wants you to do. Yes. So that's why Taoism, in some sense, there is a, a, a little bit of a rebellious quality to it, not not in a not in a social justice or a self righteous way, yeah. but in a way that I'm not going to just do what everyone else is doing because that's what you're told to do. I'm going to go and do my thing and try to come back into harmony with the way of nature. Yes, mm. and again, that quality that sage uh, has is uh, something that us as a human being and as an individuals need to be able to apply to ourselves and actualize it yes. to be able to fully um, express ourselves as a uh, independent sovereign human being yes mm. so to be a sovereign human being to be spontaneously of itself the socialization process interferes with that so that's why you have a mind of deliberation then yes so if someone says something to you you hesitate you don't act immediately and appropriately to each and every situation because you're out of accord with the Tao. 
you're in accord with socialization. And so then you're always wondering like, oh, what should I say? Or is this the, I mean, and it, you, your mind is so riddled. What you keep thinking, what's appropriate to mm. say about things in this situation. Yeah, you are completely somewhat um, disconnected with uh, your own, uh, you know, deepest nature. Yeah, you're overthinking it. Yeah, you are overthinking it, yes. And that's why, in, as in previous chapters, when talking about the nature of the Tao, Lao Tzu talks about humilities particularly because when you take the low path, that's when you actually come into power with this this zitran, this yes. spontaneous nature, spontane- mm-hmm. spontaneity of itself. Mm-hmm. Because you're, cause the greatness lies in humility, compassion, empathy. It doesn't lie in being gossipy, being a rumor monger, being a chit addicted to chit chat yes, yes it comes in silence mm. as derek says in this chapter so silent so ethereal so mm. the Tao is so silent uh and it's ethereal so it it cannot be heard seen or touched you know it's yes. it's, it's beyond all of that and so the sage tries to emulate that they come back into silence they mm. be humble yeah. they don't try to influence society or interfere in the course of other people's lives. Yes, yes. Which a politician is the the complete opposite of that. Yeah. And trying to interfere. Always interfere. Always interfere. They follow the path of interference. <laughs> <laughs> they don't follow the path of uwe, which is a path of non-interference. Yes, exactly. Whereas, yeah, sages would um, just let it all unfold, right? Yeah. Let let um, Tao takes its course to everything yes because it always works out exactly Mm. and that's why in their life they stop playing the socialization game and just allow their life to unfold Mm. so they come back into alignment with nature and try to mimic nature in a sense because when you look at nature itself you look at the birds and the beasts the trees and the bees and the ants and everything's doing its thing and it's functioning. That that chaos. There's a real. Uh, there's an order to it. There's an order in the chaos, and there's a stillness yes. in it. And so, the sage knows all they have to do is be still as nature, and in that stillness, they will come back into harmony with the order of the Tao mm. or the, the the law mm. of the Tao, the law of nature. Yes. Because in this chapter, Lao Tzu is not really mentioning nature per se he's talking about the naturalness of the world yes is it run yeah it's a principle as in principle as in principle mm. yeah yeah also i wanted to mention about this uh the second part uh, saying being great it flows it flows far away having gone far it returns mm. so here it almost saying that um it travels that far it becomes the journey of uh, in an infinity in infinite flow of energy mm. uh, under the, the law of nature mm. so again the, this greatness means infinity the infinity flows everywhere endlessly without any limitation and that uh, paradoxically whatever the energy uh, flow flew it returns to itself mm. in that infinity and that's almost Sounds like the universal cycle of the evolution and involution. Yep. Like in the Hinduism, they would say the breath of Brahma. Yeah, that's right. right. Out breath, evolution, and in uh, inhale, meaning what? Uh, involution. Involution, yeah. Right there, like that. So expansion and contraction in that yeah. way. So I think somewhat uh, Lao Tzu may talk about that energetic. Um, movement mm. within that space in infinite space I think as well so uh, here he talks about the dynamic becoming the energy energetic movement of the Tao that yeah more so than static beingness here a little bit mm. in saying that the flow flowness of the energy yeah it's as Derek says in his translation it's it's kind of a an infinite circular pattern. Right. It, there's 
and this is the, the, the thing with humans that we find difficult to conceive is, as, as they talk about in the great text, in the Nidhyasana text in, in Hinduism, so the Ashtavaka Gita and Avaduta Gita, is the concept of trying to get this in your head that there was no beginning and no end. Mm. We don't really know sort of what, because we live in a finite life as humans, right? Yes. Uh, well, we think we do. Mm. I mean, we come back life after life. Mm. But as in our so-called de facto life that we have right now, we think that this is, this is it. And so we can't understand that concept of no beginning, no birth. Yeah. And that's what Lao is trying to drill home here is that it's that infinite circular pattern or to use the band tools analogy, the lateralis, the spiral, the infinite spiral that just keeps spiraling out, just keeps spiraling. And, and in that, that song, you know, they, Maynard says to swing on the spiral, mm. you know, like don't fight it. Yeah. Swing with it. Yes. And so, mm. but this is such a hard concept for a lot of people to think about because <laughs> even, so then we say, okay, so that's eternity. And it's okay, yeah, okay, it's eternity. And that's a word of convenience as the Tao is a word of convenience as well because we need to label it in language to try and conceive it. But it's still hard to grasp as as with our puny intellects. Yes. This this idea of this this great movement of the Tao that never ends and is like this symbol of the snake eating its own tail. Mm. You know, it's just it's constantly just yeah. an infinite spiral. Yes. Infinite cycle of that evolution and involution that the universe expands and contract and con contract from that contraction to another expansion coming. Right? Yes. So it's just mm. a yeah, eternal cycle. Yeah. Mm. Well, the, as you were saying with the breath of Brahma, yeah. it's that infinite, yeah, the, the expansion and contraction or evolution and involution. And that's the, the cycle of the yugas, mm. the great time cycles of the yuga. Yes. So when we look at one kalpa or, or two kalpa of this ex expansion of the universe and then this contraction of the universe, and, and, I'm, and I mean here the physical, energetic aspects of the universe that contract and then are born again. And it's really interesting in quantum physics when Roger Penrose was talking about the particular environment that is needed for a big bang. And he was saying that when a universe contracts, uh, again, this is a theory, mm. is that there's a, there's a particular energy there that is fertile to give birth to another universe. Yeah. And so it's kind of ironic that when a, a quantum ph a, a physicist is talking about that, and that relates to the yugas within Hinduism. So this, and this is where you get into the, the universe never sort of really dies. It can't, it dies, but then the seed of the next universe is within the next one. Yes. And then, but then the question would be, well, when did this process begin? But see, that's again, we can't understand the concept of no. See, we're still asking where it began, and it's like, but it didn't begin. Because there is no beginning or the end. There's no beginning or end. And that's where it's really confusing because for us, there has to be a beginning, surely. And it's like, well, okay, there was a big bang, but this the seed of this current universe we live in was in the universe before this. So it's kind of like that meeting with Neo in the Matrix with the architect in the second Matrix where he kind of blows his mind by saying, like, this is not the, you know, the, the game in town. This is a game in town that happened, but not the game in town. Right. There's been many more before, mm. and there will continue to be many more after. So it's been constant dying and constant becoming, yep. which the, as a just a petty human body <laughs> for us to... <laughs> get that sort of concept is uh, beyond our imagination, yeah. so beyond our intellect, yeah. beyond, everything. beyond everything. We are, as we are also just a part of the very, very, very speck part of that uh, process of uh, cycle. Yeah. It is a huge uh, concept to understand. Yeah. Mm. And from that huge concept, it's really petty the way that we think about our lives <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> because like we get so wound up with our dramas 
and our dramas with other people and, and what's going on in the world. And then you say, but what about this? And then you explain the big picture and it's just like, what was I even thinking? Yeah. What was I even thinking? And that's one of the great things about Asia and particularly still now about India where the big picture is always still in mind. And this is where the Hindus are right on with the framework of the the creative process, the sustaining or maintaining process and the destructive process. When you have Brahma, which represents the creative principle of the universe, Vishnu, which represents the sustaining or preservation principle of the universe and then you have the destructive principle of the universe Shiva and so you have this whole process and they're all the Trimurti they call the Trimurti in Sanskrit and they're, they are what sort of represent the Godhead being Brahman or Tao as the process of these, this kind of samsaric cycle of the universe but it's still that that is reflected in us as well as what's saying in this chapter so yes. from so from from heaven to the human, there's this reflective process of the Tao, of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva working through us. And on a spiritual path, that represents the death of your ego, mm. the destruction of your ego. Shiva, that's why Shiva represents the fire, the burning of your of your ego. Mm. You have to throw your ego into the fire to actually reveal your true nature and uh, then it returns to brahman yeah exactly Mm. returns to the source returns to source dao it's used chinese terminology yeah and so we have that reflected in us and that's what this chapter is talking about as well you know Mm. so that's what's really interesting about the big picture yes and we get so caught up in our own little small picture with all of these little problems and this and that and as the guru said to Alan Watts at time, you know, Shiva's coming on funny today because people forget that they're Shiva, you know, or forget that they're, they're the natural essence of the Tao. Mm. Again, that connection, we've, a lot of us got co- get caught into the busy daily life and we easily lose that connection. But I think that's, uh, I mean, it's important throughout the, dawn of human civilization that having that connection and knowing that connection and keep you you are aware of it you are conscious of that yep. that you are uh, not only limited to this physical body but more so connected con- in a conscious with the consciousness it's more so you're more so we are more so connected with that the very source of all beings exactly right yeah. because we let's say we forgot that connection mm-hmm. that's why we think we are entitled to be whatever we strive to be in a very like a superficial way yeah. very um, egoic sense yeah. and that that's just coming from again ignorance exactly. that vidya. Exactly. that's that's how it is mm. and that avidya that ignorance is to what you're saying is a lot of people in the world will go around and perceive the world from their subjective experience and think everything is objective to them. It's an object. So the, the light look at me now is an object. You are an object. But then if we flip that on its head, you're looking at me saying, I'm an object, you're the subject. And the irony is the true subject is Brahman, is Tao. And we're all running around pretending we are the center of the universe. We are to a certain degree, but not when we succumb to the socialization process and our egoic tendencies, because that's what distorts our vision of reality. And that's when we think then we are the ultimate subject. That's right. I think that uh, real connection to the source of all things will be completely disconnected once we start to identify ourselves with our own our um, socialization mm, mm, the mm. condition what society tells you who you are yeah. what society tells you who you, you should be and what education taught you to think even mm, yeah. 
yeah. right? Once we start to identify with uh, these uh, other external conditioning process, then we are lost. Yeah, we are. And look at the world now, like yeah. they forgot the Tao, like they forgot Brahman. And the difference is between the average person and the sage is instead of identifying with all of the things that society tell you to identify with and attach to, they've identified with the supreme subject, Tao, Brahman, and even using the word subject, I'm using it just in relation to what we were speaking about, but the supreme ultimate, the Tao, Brahman, and that's what the sage identifies with. So instantly when they move and turn their gaze away from the socialization process and, and identifying with the things that they've been taught to identify with and, and, and actually identify with the way things are, then life has a beautiful way of happening for them. There's like this eternal becoming. Yes. And so this process of zitran is constantly happening where things are organically of themselves just happening in their life. And that's how you can live a real divine life. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're living the life of socialization and you're grinding the axe and you're suffering in your life and you're wondering why you're not getting ahead, it's because you're playing that game. Yes, that's right. Again, we mentioned many times uh, throughout this Tao Te Ching um, series that going back to the sim simple life, the simplicity is the key to regain that connection with the Tao, right? Instead of jumping into you know everyday news and checking the phone and whatnot <laughs> yeah you're just going back to the simple life the simplicity exactly and that in that simplicity is the that law of nature that naturalness the law of the Tao. it's not in complexity mm -hmm. and that's the the irony of the Tao. that's and we've spoken about this in one of the previous episodes on the, on this series is that that's, that's the irony of it right mm -hmm. people are trying to find that essence of the Tao in their complex lives yeah and you need to return a simplicity to find it that's the irony mm. and that doesn't mean you have to go crazy it doesn't mean you have to sell everything and this and that but it may mean that you may want to stop being so busy it may mean you might want to sell a lot of things it yeah. may mean you want to be comfortable with just the way you are without adding things to yourself, being comfortable in being ordinary. Mm -hmm. Because in, in being ordinary, without trying to stand out and, and seeking attention, mm -hmm. there's a real great freedom in that because that's where the doubt resides. You don't gain it by seeking attention. You just don't because you're self-involved. And so when you're self-involved, you cannot know the doubt because you are differentiated. Yes. To know the doubt, you have to be undifferentiated. Mm -hmm. So you have to continue to move back to simplicity and allow your mind to decomplexify and then next minute you see the world naturally as it is without your conditioning interfering with what you see. Mm -hmm. And that's the essence of coming back into harmony with the Tao. Yes. When we constantly identify ourselves with uh, what we see externally, there's constant... Um, there's constant exhaustion, I think. We get so tired because we try to try so hard to be that image that you see externally, right? Mm. But as you mentioned, that process of becoming free from everything and going back to that simplicity, from there you're actually empowering yourself, right? Mm. Because all that energy that you were wasting mm. is actually all yours. And that resides within you. And that that uh, essence that we regain is the is the doubt that origin of all things. That that uh, energy yep. and that which doesn't change, which doesn't disappear, mm. which never get exhausted. Mm. That's why even in this verse, saying that that standing alone and unchanging, mm. ever present in motion. Yep. That is that power we get to regain from the process of that freeing ourselves from status quo. Mm. That's that empowerment. Yep. And that's like when we look at what is the Tao, and as you said, we have all of that power already innately within us. 
is that the Tao is independent because it is self-reliant. Like it is spontaneously of itself. Now, what I mean by that is it has everything and it requires nothing. Mm -hmm. And we are exactly the same as the Tao. We have everything and require mm. nothing. We already have the essence of the universe flowing through us. And our, the order and the nature of our beingness is already in tune organically. But the problem is, is we live in a world where we are taught that we need to gain things to accentuate ourselves, to prove mm. our worth. But that's not how it is. Zitran organically of itself I remember organically of itself it's independent yes and in in falling into harmony with that you fall into harmony with the world it's like when we look out into nature right and we look at all sort certain different trees and this and that doing their own thing organically of themselves but they fit with everything else and this is what yin is mutual resonance and interdependence but you can only come into harmony with that when you realize your li and realize your your radical independence from the socialization process because you already have everything you contain everything and you require nothing from what an ideology can offer you for yes. example yes again the nature of the they are in in principle naturally of itself the zutran in itself is complete yep. it itself is complete like you said where nothing requires because it in itself it's done it's complete mm -hmm. it's it as it is it's perfect mm. and again we are the reflection of that we are that yep. as well and that complete is that complete possibility mm. that is where again that's why all these material worlds came from yep. and we need to remind ourselves that yeah, we are that that of itself itself is complete yeah you don't have to go ask and require and accumulate things to uh, you to look certain way accumulating knowledge or accumulating information that is all part of it as well not just superficial uh, mm. looks mm. And when you realize you are complete as you are, that's how you know the Tao. Mm. And that's why the two main different philosophies during the Warring States period of China was Confucius's ca carving and polishing metaphor, the self-cultivation -cultiva method, versus Lao Tzu's uncarved block or yes. unhewn wood which means just return to your nature mm -hmm. minus don't cultivate. Mm -hmm. yeah. So avoid self-cultivation. Now, he's not saying this in a real strict sense of the word. He's talking about it in relation to the cultivation process we go through through socialization. Mm -hmm. So in, in his time, it was through the Confucian system, the Ru philosophy and, you know, other religions and and. and social etiquette and ethics and everything like that. Yeah. And so that's uh, those two philosophies are something that always a Taoist and a spiritual seeker actually have to hone in on because the uncarved block, Lao Tzu, is reinforcing into our mind that we do belong and we have everything as we are. Mm. You don't need to go out and change yourself and do everything and cultivate yourself to become someone or the self-image you have in your mind yeah. you actually have to kill the self-image and reverse the cultivation process mm -hmm. and come back into harmony with just the way you are mm. yeah, the undoing process the undoing process that's right mm. okay guys we hope you enjoyed and we'll see you guys next time <laughs>